Ladies and gents, I do appreciate your time this evening, particularly those who are in Rosebank. Trading is a side hustle, trading for income. Now, Edition said there's no get rich quick, and he's almost right. There is one way we get rich quick, and that's marry money. Aside from that, it's a process, uh, not even the lotto accounts. Yeah, every time <laughs> Standard Bank sends me an SMS to say the lotto is 75 million, when it's 75 million, I buy a 75 rand ticket. My winning so far is 11 bucks. I know, I know, but let's be clear, my winnings, my costing is way more than, 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 than the 11 bucks. So we're talking trading this evening as distinct from investing. You've got a long-term investment portfolio. You've got a tax-free account. You've got a Reg 28. All of those are not what we're talking about this evening. We're talking about trading. And this picture there best symbolizes trading. You're looking at it and thinking, I kind of know what that is. What it actually is, it's a map of the world. The trick is it's a Peter's projection map, which is accurate with size, not shape. The map that we all know of the world was, of course, done by the English. How do we know that? Well, because they square center and they actually make themselves look bigger because on that map, England is but a speck of dust off the coast of France, maybe a little croissant dust or something like that. And that's what trading is. A lot of trading requires us to look differently at things that we think we know about, including very importantly, ourselves. And we're going to spend a fair bit of time on that this evening. I've got an hour, which means I will talk for the full hour. It also means that at the end of this, you will be smarter, but you will not be a trader. This is a process. This is going to take some time to develop those skills and to get to ultimately a successful and successful equals profitable trader. That is going to be a journey. This is part of that journey this evening. So what are we talking about when we're talking trading? We're talking typically short-term positions. And that can be anything from seconds to years. I mean, I've got one trade in my, in my current trade uh, portfolio right now, which I entered in August. In fact, I got two from August. There was one trade I once held, I think, for seven years. Point is, if it's going up and making me money, I'm going to stay right where I am. There's no need to get out. You know, I'm, I'm old school. I like money. If you're making me money, I'll stay. So it's typically short term. It often is associated with derivatives. When people say trading, they think I'm going to be talking about futures and CFDs and, and options and all of these. And those are trading instruments, but they needn't be. I use very little derivatives in my trading. In fact, of my various different systems, I'm only really using derivatives in one place. That's all the futures. I'm going to come back to that more in a moment. But here's a quick thing. You're learning to trade and you trade with derivatives. It's basically, I don't know, it's like getting in a, in a Lamborghini and closing your eyes after a, like a bottle of whiskey. The answer is you're going to crash. The question is just how long. And it's going to be measured in inches, not meters or anything like that. And that's what derivatives do. They put it on speed. They put it on steroids. And that is not, so that's not where we start. But I'm going to come back to that. Truthfully, trading is simple, right? You buy stuff that's going up and you sell stuff that's going down. Rocket science required. Zero. Very truthfully, it's actually a whole lot harder than that. There is the mental aspect, which is immensely difficult, and truthfully, the challenge of it. There is risk management, which is easy on paper, but again, very difficult in practice. You've bought something, you're now losing money. The right thing to do is get out. No, that's the last thing you want to do. You want to first go and, I don't know, find some way to make it go higher and to make you make money. So it's the, it's the psychology, psychology. What can be traded? Truthfully, anything. The, what we're talking this evening is on exchange products that we're trading, of course. But you can trade absolutely anything. I got a lovely scarf there. I could trade it for the right price. It's a trade. What we're talking this evening is going to be on market. You're either using technical analysis, which is looking at charts. You're using fundamentals, which is looking at results. Or you're using a combination of both. I'm going to go into details of both of those as we go through this evening. So we'll park that there for now. There are some trading truths that really matter. The first truth, most lose money. And they don't lose money because you're stupid or incompetent. You lose money because you jumped in thinking that this was going to be easy. If you wanted to be anything in life, a brain surgeon, a plumber, anything in between, you would expect to have to learn some stuff. Trading's no different. The problem with trading is we open a trading account, we do our FICA, we deposit some money, and we think, 
I are trader. No, no. You are somebody about to be parted from your money. It's going to be painful. There might be blood. We've got to learn the skills. No one disputes that for a second. The reason people lo lose is because they jump in with money and they think, I will be rich by the weekend. I have a big date planned. Man, I need money by Friday. And yes, today's Thursday, but like I've got all of Friday. Yeah, you've got all of Friday to lose your fingers. Price is the only truth in the market. I can't stress this enough. Price is your only truth. What do I mean by that? We all have opinions. The results were good. The results were bad. The earning potential is great. The GNU is the best thing ever to happen. The GNU is the worst thing ever to happen. The GNU is not a GNU, it's a coalition. These are all opinions. The share should go up, the share should go down. The dividend will be bigger, the stock is expensive. These are all opinions. But you and I trade a share, or my scarf, or whatever it is. And we trade, and there's money on the table. Now that's true. That's not opinion. That is me putting money behind my opinion. So price is the only truth in the market. When something is going up, we can debate until we blue in the face. Why? We can debate that it's too expensive. We can debate that it's crazy. We can debate that it's not fair. But the truth is, it's going up. And your job as a trader is to say, well, <laughs> am I in and making money or am I out and watching? And watching is a perfectly valuable, uh, viable position. Being on the sideline and watching is perfectly fine. I spend a lot of time watching. But price is what matters. The market doesn't care what you think. The market will take your money. Somebody in the market will take your money. But the market doesn't care what you think. It doesn't care of your opinion. You could have more degrees than I've had hot breakfasts. It still doesn't care. You have either brave traders or old traders. You don't have old brave traders. YOLA, you only live once. You do only live once. So do it right. Do it sensibly. You can be brave. That's fun. Until eventually someone chops your head off. You're either old or brave. You want to be an old trader. That is what your ultimate aim is. Selling, truthfully, is what matters. And I'll tell you why we can, I mean, there is an experiment as old as time where you can basically toss a coin and make money. Heads you buy, tails you sell. Trick is when you're wrong, you sell at 1% loss. And when you're right, you sell at 2% profit. The coin is 50-50, you make money. It's the selling that matters. Selling at profit or selling at loss. At loss, as small as possible. At profit, as big as possible. The problem with profit is how big's big. I remember when Nvidia hit $400, now $40 split adjusted. And some chap I know owned Nvidia and he said, what should he do? And I said, this is beyond my expertise. I don't know. He sold. I think there are $140 today. A couple of weeks ago, he phoned me. He said, what should he do now? Because he sold. I'm like, dude, I didn't know then. I don't know now. Selling. And selling is hard. Selling is hard because you're going to lock in that loss and it's emotional. No one wants to lose money. No one wants to get home today and realize they've lost 100 bucks from their wallet. That's what's going to happen to you in trading. Not once, not 50 times, not 100 times, thousands of times. Literally thousands of times. Selling. Learn to sell well. And find ways to maximize the profit. And I'll show you some tricks on that. And we are not talking day trading. Classic day trading is where you trade in the day and you have no positions left at night. You go to bed, you have no positions. It's lovely and all. The problem with day trading, particularly when you're a newbie, is you will lose money day trading and you will lose your job because your boss will fire you because you're not doing your job. You're actually day trading. There's an important point, and I'm going to come back to it. You trade how you want to. The market does not dictate to you. The market says, in this space of the market, it is whatever. Let's say it's a swimming pool. Here, the water is one feet deep. Uh, I'm six foot. I don't want that part. Here, the water is 50 feet deep. And there's different parts at different levels. And you pick the space you like. Some places of the pool have got cocktails. Others have got sandwiches. It's you to find the one that best suits you. That's important. Also, this trading 
longer time frame becomes easier. If you're trading a one second chart, the time for your decision is less than one second. And when I say your decision, your decision and your action is less than 1%. That's Formula One driver type stuff. If you're trading a weekly chart, well, you've got time in your hands. And good trading is ultimately boring. If you're having fun trading, you are losing money. And I'm going to talk more about this in a, moment, in a slide or two. Trading ultimately is just a way to make some money. I think it's an easier way. I think there's benefits because I can do it anywhere with an internet connection and a mobile device. But it's not the thrill. If you want thrills, go down to Soweto, cooling towers, jump off one. Man, that's a thrill. So what do you need to trade? Nothing fancy. You need a device. In, in the olden days, they used to say a laptop, but these days it can be a phone, a tablet, it can be anything. You need a device. Uh, you need a brokerage account. You need a fancy brokerage account. I get these emails. I got one today. This guy's found this website. I go and I, I do some digging. It turns out you can't send them money. You have to send them Bitcoin. And why? Because they're in Russia and they can't get SWIFT money. I'm like, yo, dude, like, what are you? Really? Go with the brands, you know, Center Bank. We've got online share trading, web trader, auto share investor, shift. All of them enable you to trade. Different ways, we'll talk about those. But we don't need to go find some place in Russia who can't take payments because they're Russian. Whose best friend is now North Korea. Uh, you need capital to trade with. We'll come back to that. You need time to learn. You need willingness to learn. If you are stubborn, this, the market is going to beat that stubbornness out of you, which might be a good thing, particularly if you've got an eight-year-old. You need time to manage trades, to engage. Now, I, I've been down the road of being a day trader, eight, ten hours a day, sitting in front of screens, and I realized there was a world out there. I spend three or so minutes in the morning trading, and then I spend collectively over a week, maybe half an hour. Lazy trader. The market must work for me. I don't want to be working for the market. That is not my idea. You could have a stomach for losing money because not every trade is a winner, and ultimately you need a trading edge that makes you consistent money. But I want to come back to that. Not every trade is a winner. Roger Federer, a tennis player, for those who don't know, uh, gave a, a, a commencement speech recently in the States, and he made a couple of important points. He won 80% of the matches he played. I actually would have said it was higher, but anyway, he won 80% of the matches he played, but he only won 54% of the points that he played. And that's the same as trading. I have a trading system, which if it works well, I make 300 points. If it works badly, I lose 200 points. I only need a 40% win ratio for that system to make me money. My equity trading system, which is a breakout system, I, I could probably get away with a lower win ratio. I could probably get away with a win ratio somewhere in the 25% range. If you're getting win ratios above 60%, I mean, be careful because it's almost too good to be true. You need a win ratio somewhere between 35 and 55% because your winners are bigger than your losers. My lotto ticket, when I win that 75 million, all those 75 buck losses are not going to matter to me because I've got the big winner. Your winners are bigger than your losers. If your average trade makes you a thousand rand, when you make a profit, and when you lose, you lose 500 Rand, and you've got a 50-50 uh, uh, win-loss ratio, you're making money. So you, you're not targeting 100% success. You're not even targeting 70. You're targeting, as I said, somewhere kind of like metric passes, 35 to 55, and you're good to go. Is it 35? When I was at school, it was 33 and a third. That was a long time ago. So what are the five things we need to be a successful trader? This was a, a matrix my then colleague, Manfred Harbeck, and I put together now, yo, plus 20 years ago when we were running SA Warrants. The five components we need in order for success. We need goals, discipline, MM is money management, resources, and we need a system. 
I'm going to come back to those four in a moment. I'm going to touch on goals right now. The problem with goals, if you've ever heard a motivational speaker, you've ever read one of those books you can buy around how to win at life and stuff, they give you great, big, audacious, hairy goals. And no one ever achieves them. If your goal is to have a billion rand, no, no, forget that. Let's have a real currency. If your goal is to have a billion euros, and you're standing here right now with your 100 bucks in your pocket and your target's a billion euros. Why not? I mean, extreme big. The problem is that the chasm from here to there is fundamentally enormous. You can't leap it because you know you will fail. So you kind of wander around almost aimlessly in a sense. And over time, you actually become scared of that goal and you kind of stop looking at it and then you hope no one asks about it. Goals need to be bite size and achievable. So if your goal is to have a billion euros as a trader, what's the first part of the goal? Well, the first goal was to come this evening. Cool, done. Now you've got positive affirmation. Now you feel that you achieved something and you're moving forward. What's your second goal? To rewatch the video again tomorrow morning because there might have been some pieces you lost. Boom, you're on the next stage. Third goal, and you see what I'm doing? Small, little, bite-sized pieces. Next goal, make a thousand bucks. You made a thousand bucks, goal after that, make another thousand. It's tiny little steps. Then your goals become achievable. Then you actually one day, it's kind of you're building along and you suddenly look up and there's the billion euros. Touching distance. And then you realize actually 925 million euros is plenty and you can quit because you've got more money than you can spend. So it's about making those goals bite size. Very important. Write them down with pen and paper. Writing them down doesn't mean they will be achieved. Not writing them down means they almost certainly won't be achieved. Stanford University did a study, this goes back into mid to late 90s. People who wrote down their goals were six times more likely to achieve them than people who didn't. The act of writing it down is meaningful to our brain. How do we learn? When we write it down, that's how we learn. They've done research in students at universities. The students who work on laptops versus the students who work with pen and paper, the kids with pen and paper do better. That's how our brain works. I'm like, we can go into the neuroscience of it, but we haven't got time this evening. So, goals. I'll come to the others in a moment. Now I want to go to Maslow. You all know Maslow, his hierarchy of needs. The bottom, you know, food, shelter, goes its way up. Right at the top is Wi-Fi. He did a whole bunch of other stuff. So where do we start? And this is true of anything that we're trying to learn, anything that we're trying to master. We start as unconsciously incompetent. We know nothing and we are unaware of that fact, and that is nobody here this evening. Because the unconsciously incompetent is sitting out there somewhere in the streets of Josie thinking that they're a master trader by this time tomorrow. But that is, it's the naivety of it. And then we get into the discovery part, which is what this evening is about. And you will go find some books and you will find some websites and you'll start getting a little bit smarter and you'll start looking at some charts or some fundamentals and you'll start looking at things differently and you become consciously incompetent. You are aware of your shortcomings. You suddenly realize, yo. There's a lot out there that I've got to learn. And you put your head down and you work hard and you learn the old fashioned way. That's where most people bust out. That's where you get discouraged. It's just harder than you thought. It's not happening any Friday this year. But you move on to conscious competence. But you're actually fairly skilled. You're actually doing quite well. There is a problem. Your equity curve in your portfolio goes up and up and up, and then it takes a leg down. And up and up and up, and it takes a leg down. You're not quite there. If we go back to the Roger Federer quote, you're not winning 56% of points, you're winning 49. And if you're winning 49% of points, we don't know who you are. At 56%, we know you're Roger Federer. And then eventually, you get to the unconscious competence, where this is now second nature. It's intuition. When I'm trading, I entered a trade on Friday afternoon. And I look at it and it's doing everything I need. And about halfway through, I realize 
I've just clicked the button. It's kind of gone through and I suddenly panicked. I thought, yo, have I done the right trade size? And then the order kind of pops up almost immediately on, on Iris and bang, yeah, okay, I did the right trade size. It becomes unconsciously competent. We do it without thinking. And there's something which humans are brilliant at. We're all breathing. I'm walking. I'm not thinking about any of those. Most of you drove here. We don't walk in the streets of Josie. You drove here this evening. First time you got in a car to drive, it's a stick car. If you did like anyone else, you stalled it. If you're like me, the, my father said, don't drive into the ditch. What did I do? Magnet, man, into the ditch. Now when you drive, you're not going to remember the drive. I mean, you sort of know how you got here, right? You got your way to Craddock. You, you're not going to remember the gear change, the indicating. Well, unless you're a driver of a car, it doesn't indicate. No names need mentioning. You're doing it competently, you're here, and you're doing it unconsciously. You think about other things, you listen to the radio, you're thinking about this evening, you're thinking about the day behind, the weekend ahead. That's where we need to get to. At that point, when you suddenly realize that you're doing it without thinking, trading is boring as is driving. I remember my first driving, it was huge fun. Now it's, I mean, I drive a roadster, so it's designed to be fun, but driving becomes a bit of a chore, unless you put the foot down. So. Let's go back to gearing and derivatives. I spoke about them earlier and I said that that is typically where we jump in, but that is the risk that we have. What have we got here? Contract for difference, uh, futures, uh, warrants, installments, which are essentially options. These are the sort of things that are going to get bandied around and that you're going to hear the terms used all over the place in the trading space. Nothing wrong with them, but what you've done is you've given the 15-year-old learning how to drive the keys to the Lamborghini, blindfolded them, and said, be careful. There are going to be many things. Careful is not one of them. Gearing is fine, but understand what you're doing with gearing. So here's a quick example. You've got 20,000 Rand. That is in your trading account. And you go and buy a CFD on a particular share. The gearing enables you to 100,000 Rand exposure. Your 20,000 is now 100,000. You are geared five times. That extra 80,000, which magically appeared, is actually a loan to you from the provider. And let's be clear, it's a loan, right? The provider wants that money back if things go wrong. The position moves to 120,000 value. In other words, it's up 20%. But your profit is 20,000 on 20,000. You've doubled your money. Stock only moved 10, 20%, you've doubled your money. And who doesn't look at that and think, hmm, I would like a slice of that. Look what our market did on Tuesday. Banking stocks up 10, 12, 15%. South African retailers up 10%. Okay, make that five times more. Now we're talking. Downside, what happens if it goes the other way? Your 100,000 position moves to 80,000. You've lost 20,000. You've lost 100%. And let's be clear. You can lose more than you started with, and that should scare you. Now, am I saying don't trade derivatives? No. I'm saying don't start with derivatives. Start with the boring stuff. And we'll touch on boring stuff in a moment. You also, on that 80,000, you are paying interest. It's a loan. You're paying interest. I don't use the gearing because I hold positions that will run for sometimes ages. And therefore, my interest bill can become quite onerous. We'll dig into that in more detail in a moment. Here are the sort of products that you can trade. So all of these pictures are Dali 3 again. And I asked them here for two penguins, one being dangerous and one not. So which one's not being dangerous? I suppose, I, I suppose the one eating are... I, Dali 3 has gotten better. There's some places it hasn't gotten better. Um, and i got to say, penguins? So in terms of risk, from high to low, crypto, individual equity, commodities, indices, bonds, FX. FX is your lowest risk, crypto is your highest risk. Well, how am I defining risk? Volatility. How much can it move while you are busy blinking? Crypto, you can go to bed, wake up in the morning and it's moved 10%. Crypto is a 24-7 market. 
Most other markets are, I mean, our equity market is a 8.5, open eight hours a day uh, and then five days a week. Uh, FX is a 24.5, open 24 hours a day, five days a week. The trick with FX is that it is the place to start, but an FX contract is 100,000 of the opposing currency. So let's say you're trading dollar. It's 100,000 dollar. 2 million rand per lot. No worries, says the provider. You haven't got 2 million. Just give me 20,000 and I'll let you trade it. You're now geared 100 times. You've now borrowed $1.98 million. So there's a small lot, which is only 100,000, sorry, 10,000. So it's only uh, 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 $10,000 per lot, which is called a 200,000 rand. And again, the provider will say, yeah, 200,000, just give me 200. You now get 1,000 times and you've effectively borrowed 199,000 and some change. The problem with FX is not the FX, it's the gearing. And at 1,000 times gearing, at 100 times gearing, at 10 times gearing, you will go bust. There are, however, currency futures. They're traded via SAFX, you get them on online share trading, and they're a whole different game. Your gearing is about seven. They nice. So the volatility there is because you're trading the czar. And the czar is a bit of a so it's czar dollar, czar euro, uh, czar sterling. So your volatility comes in that the czar can move crazy. But you're only going to be geared five, six, maybe seven times. Stay away from those folks coming at you and saying, man, FX, we've got a lovely little app. You only got to put $25 in. You'll be broke before you blink your eyes. And let's be clear, you will be broke. Those, I was at a FX symposium thingy the other couple of weeks ago, and there's all these Ferraris and Lamborghinis and stuff. Let's be very clear, those Ferraris and Lamborghinis were not paid for by people's trading FX. Those Ferraris and Lamborghinis were paid for by you losing money trading FX and it going into those people's accounts. They are not FX traders, they are FX salespeople. Fundamentally different. I can't stress that enough. Fundamentally different. Bonds are lovely but boring. Indices, commodities. So what don't you trade? Don't trade FX. Don't trade geared equities. Don't trade crypto. Trade ungeared equities. In other words, just swim or buy the share. If you think the share is going up a whole bunch, then buy it. You don't need CFDs. In time, when you've proved it and you've got the expertise, sure, CFDs. And indices. The problem, the problem with crypto is it's crazy. The problem with individual shares is single event risk. Something happens and bang, a stock can move 10%. An announcement comes from BHP Group that they're going to buy, or well, they wish to buy Anglo American, but they don't want Kumba and Anglo Platt. Anglo American goes up 20%, Kumba and Anglo Platt both go down 15 you were sitting there in a nice position in Anglo Platt for whatever reason, and you wake up the next morning and you are 15% down. If you are dead, you're 100% down. Single event risk. We had the second biggest day, in the, I'll take that back. We had the biggest day in the market on Tuesday since 15th of February 2018. And our index was up three and a half. I mean, a giant day in our market. And we have three and a half percent. And it's if you're on the wrong side of the trade. Because we're always looking at, yeah, but if I'm right. And if you're not. The question is, when you're wrong, you still need to be able to trade again tomorrow. You need to have the cash, you need to have the mental stability, and you need the fingers to click your mouse buttons. So start with ungearing and start with indices. And indices can be ETFs. And I'm going to come back to both of those. We'll look at some examples around it. I've talked about getting out when you're wrong. We call that a stop loss. For a trader, a stop loss rules supreme. The stop loss is a predetermined price at which you exit no questions asked because you are wrong. You said it was going up, it went down. In the simplest way in the world, you were wrong. It was a binary process, right? Okay. The share can go three ways, up, down, or sideways. Let's forget about the sideways. Shares going up or down. You said up, it went down, you were wrong. At some point, you've got to admit you were wrong and take your money out. That's what a stop loss does. 
You can do it on price. You can do it on fundamentals. You can do it on a chart. Key point for stop loss is don't make them too tight. I see folks who are trading equities and they do 3% stop loss. And I say, but what's the average daily range of this particular share? Two and a half percent. I small little blip and you're stopped out. Because the worst thing that happens, you buy a share, goes up, goes down, stops you out, checks that you're out. Yes, you definitely, and then goes to the moon and you're left like, yo, hang on, hang on, well, what about me? Give it space. Give it lots of space. My stop losses typically on equities run at about 10%. And that sounds terrifying. But my profits on equities typically run at about 54%. So again, if I'm right half the time, half the time I lose 10%, half the time I make 50%, I'm ahead of the game. The problem with stop loss is that when you're sitting there in front of the chart and you're saying, yeah, yeah, I'm going to put it there, and then it gets stopped, and you're going to say, mm, maybe I'll just move it a little bit. And then get hit again. Mm, maybe I'll just. Point is, the first time the stop loss gets hit is the cheapest time because you will get a second chance to get out. It just costs you more. You'll get a third as well. It'll just cost you more. You get hit, you get out. You take the money and you run. Here's the other thing. Don't put the stop loss in an obvious place. Pretend stop loss is a game of hide and seek. Hide the stop loss where no one would be looking. You want to put the stop loss where you say, it's not that I'm wrong. It's that the share won't go there. The share can't go there. It's not possible for it to go there. Bang, it goes there. But at least you hit it in an, in, not an obvious place. And I'll show you some examples where you can put a stop loss and it's just so obvious. Because those of you who have had some experience of trading, you're going to say, yeah, but aren't there people out there who will run stocks or whatever to run stop losses? Yes. This market is a tug of war. I've made 900 points trading in the, uh, Aussie this week. That means somebody out there is telling their friends that they've lost 900 points trading Aussie this week. The money's in my pocket, not theirs. Okay, it's been an easy week to trade Aussie. But you've got to put that stop loss somewhere where it's not obvious. Because if you do it, obviously, you're going to get kicked out. If you do it too tight, you're going to get kicked out. And without stop loss, you go bust. Because one day, you buy a share that goes to zero. And you hold on the whole way down because you're like, yeah, stop losses for sissies. No, no, stop losses are for people who come back and trade again tomorrow. It is brutal. You've done all of your research. You've made the decision. You've clicked the button. Online share trading is extra brutal. They pop up a thing that says, are you sure? No, you are not sure. You're scared, you're nervous, you're not sure, and the box says, are you sure? Close your eyes, say, yes, I'm sure. What it should actually say is, do you think, that, like, it should just be a little more polite. Are you sure? It's like a little, like, like, the written in your face. But you've done all your research, you've done all your hard work, you've bought the share, you're expecting it to go higher, and it goes down, and you've got two things eating at your brain. One, you were wrong. Two, rubbing salt in the wound, it costs you money to be wrong. It's like every time you argue with your spouse or your child and they're right, you've got to now take out your wallet, admit you were wrong, and give them money. Stop losses are mentally hard. And that's what I say when trading is more than anything a mental game. Managing those emotions. Think about money. Think about the idioms about money. We do not, as a humanity, have a positive relationship with money. A fool in his money is soon parted. It's sort of, you know, we don't talk about it. That relationship with money is deep centered within us in human beings. And now I'm going to say to you, yeah, you lost money. It doesn't matter. The right thing to do is get the heck out of Dodge and stop losing more money. So stop loss is critical. But then there's another part to the, to the, to the risk management because this is your risk management your money management the first is a stop loss that says this is where you get out no questions asked 
And the best thing to do is to put the stop loss in the system, i.e. online share trading, go there, say stop loss. The market cannot see your stop loss. The way the system is designed, it, they can't see yours, they can't physically see it. So that when it triggers, first thing you know is SMS, you're out. Weakest link in trading, me, you, the individual. We're the weak link. Try and remove us where possible. But then the thing is how much to buy. So I remember my first trade, I had whatever it was, X thousand Rand. I was trading warrants, this is uh, late 97. It was a Sassel warrant, SOL1 was the code. So anyway, I've got, I don't know, call it 5,000 Rand. So what do I do? Well, I buy 5,000 Rand's worth of Sassel warrant. My wife and I go on holiday up to the West Coast. I'm checking prices by looking at the newspaper the next morning. Needless to say, I got home and my 5,000 Rand was no longer there. Wow, it was. It was 50 bucks. Hey, back then, 50 bucks did something. You, know, you could actually go out and one of you could have a burger. These are your five outcomes. Toss a coin, those are your five outcomes you're gonna get. Small profit, small loss, break even, big profit, big loss. Stop loss simply removes the big loss and suddenly that makes money. Bang, that simple. You've just removed the big loss. The rest will be natural distribution of coin tosses. Never mind anything else. The next part is position size, which is the 2% rule. The 2% rule says, how much do you risk in a trade? If I'm putting 10,000 Rand into a trade, I'm only risking 10,000 if I'm happy to see that share go to zero. In essence, at some point I will stop out and I would have taken a 500 Rand risk. 500 Rand is 5% of 10,000. So 2% rule, says that you're prepared to risk 2% of your capital in any one trade at a time. It means, and the mathematicians here are gonna tell me about log, but let's pretend log doesn't exist and it's only linear. It means you need 50 losing trades in a row before you bust out. Five zero trades in a row before you bust out. Is that possible? Look, if it is, just turn your chart upside down and you get 50 winners in a row. So you've got a 10,000 Rand portfolio, it means you can lose 200 Rand. What's very important, I'm not saying your stop loss is 2%. Let's use an example. You've got a 50K portfolio, 2% is 1,000 Rand. You can lose 1,000 Rand in one individual trade. It means if you have 10 losers in a row, you've lost 10,000 Rand and your 50 is now 40. That's terrible, but you've still got 40 left. You still live to fight another day. If you're risking 10% per trade, 10 losses, and you're bust out and going home. So your position entry is 12 Rand 50. I don't know what you're buying, whatever it is, it's 12 Rand 50. You've had a long, hard look at the chart and you've decided your stop loss is at 10 Rand. When this share goes to 10 Rand, and don't use 10 Rand, it's far too obvious, use 9 Rand 84. But I'm using 10 Rand for the example because I can do the math nice and simple. So your stop loss is effectively 20%, right? Big but whatever. So your risk per individual share is 2 Rand 50. You buy a share at 12 Rand 50, you immediately get stopped out at 10 Rand, you've lost 2 Rand 50 in that share. You divide that risk per share into your 1,000 Rand, which is your 2%, and your answer is 400. So you go and buy 400 shares. If you then get stopped out, you've lost 2 Rand 50 per share times your 400, you've lost 1,000 Rand, you've now got 49,000 Rand to play with. You had a losing trade and you're still good to go. Now there's a lot here that folks are seeing like, well, hang on a second, this doesn't give me much wiggle room for trading, what if I've only got 500 bucks? We'll come back to some of those points. But this keeps you in the game, particularly when you have, my record of losing streaks in trading is I think 13 in a row. One, three, 13 trades in a row, I lost money. Now not all of them are max stopped out, right? Because you get in the position, it goes in your favor and moves higher, and then you move the stop loss up carefully behind it. Then it falls, so you didn't lose two Rand 50, you only lost one Rand 50, or maybe 50 cents. 
And at some point, your stop loss will be above 1250. Your stop loss will be at 14 Rand. Because as the trade's going in your favor, you move that stop loss up behind you. You never move the stop loss down. You only ever move it higher. Key rule. Stop losses go up. They don't go down. It does mean that small portfolios struggle with proper risk management. There are a couple of things here. Start with trading OMI. I'll talk around OMI in a moment. I think the OMI is the second best thing in the world to trade. The best is Aussie. The OMI is the mini brother of the Aussie. It does mean that if you've got 500 bucks or small amounts of money, it's almost impossible to properly do efficient risk management. So you've then got two options. One, wait and save. And nobody likes that option. Option two is to say, okay, I get the 2% rule, but I simply can't do that right now. But how's the best way that we learn? By doing. All the theory in the world is lovely, but we learn by actually practically doing. So you say to yourself, okay, I haven't got the money to do the full risk, but let me at least take a small amount and try. But then keep it small. And when you get to that point where you can do proper risk management, absolutely implement it. Because there's a, there's, there's, it really is. We, we learn by doing. You're not going to become unconsciously competent with paper money. Because it's just not real. You can do all the paper trades in the world. As soon as you do your first trade with 10 bucks, man, it hurts your head in different ways you didn't even understand. I talked about goals a moment ago. Every trade I do, my goal is to have a perfect trade. And those are my seven requirements for a perfect trade. Truthfully, that list is probably too long. I probably could have got away with less. You can use it. You can tweak it. You can adjust it. You can add to it. You can, can subtract to it. It's basically keeping me in the straight and narrow. After every trade, I mark myself. What am I looking for? Seven out of seven. Six out of seven is not a perfect trade. I'm not interested in good trades or very good trades or could try harder trades. I want perfect trades. My goal when I started this was to have one perfect trade, then two, then three. I should have checked the number. I think I'm up to 314 perfect trades. I make money trading because I'm disciplined. I make money trading because every time for the last 24 and a half years when my stop loss has been hit, I have exited every single time, 100% of the time. I do not make money trading because I'm a brilliant technician or technical analyst or fundamentalist. I do not make money trading because I have fast computers or brilliant brokers. I make money trading because I'm disciplined. And this keeps me disciplined. What do you notice is missing from there? I never ask if I made a profit. You know why? Because those seven things I can control. Making a profit, I can't control. What happens if you buy a share and the very next day, and I've got an example, Hello Pick and Pay, they come out and say they're going to do a four billion rights issue, they're going to sell Boxer, the company's bankrupt, and there's no hope. Is that my fault? No. But it did mean I didn't make money on the trade. Because the point is, exiting at stop loss and losing money is still doing the right thing. In other words, I'm measuring myself on what I can control. And if I'm getting perfect trades every time, over time, there will be losers, but there will be more winners. The winners will be bigger than the losers, and I will make money. Doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Every single time. It's why trading ultimately is boring, because it is repet it's repetition. The right thing at the right time for the right reason every single time. Not for days, weeks, or months. Not for years, but for the rest of your trading career, which in an ideal world is going to be decades. The right thing at the right time for the right reason every, every single time. I cannot stress it. When I speak to successful traders, Eagle, Garth McKenzie, Warren Peacock, 
and I say, what's your edge? They all say the same thing. Discipline. Discipline. Fifthly, if I asked Roger, Roger, Roger Federer what his edge was, it's probably the same. He's got natural talent. But his edge is probably the discipline to go and train when the last thing you want to do is train. Spend hours on court hitting balls. Discipline. More than anything. So, we have two ways that we can make decisions on what to buy. Technical analysis, looking at the charts. Fundamental analysis, looking at the results. The one side will tell you the other side is crazy. The other side will tell you the other side is crazy. Neither are crazy. The truth is, they've both got pros and cons. Technicals, keep it simple. Ignore indicators, price action rules. Weekly is better than daily. What I mean by keep it simple, I can remember getting my first charting package in 1995. I discovered indicators. I put about 40 of them on, and I thought somewhere here is the holy grail. And just like the Holy Grail, we're still looking for it. But there's a bigger point here. What's an indicator or an oscillator? It's a mathematical derivative of the price. If price is my truth, an indicator or an oscillator takes me away from my truth. And if you understand how that math works, you can look at the chart and see what that indicator or oscillator would be telling you. My chart will have one of two things on it. It'll have two exponential moving averages, or it'll have some horizontal trend lines. I don't do trend lines that are at angles. Why? Human bias. What's the biggest risk to my trading? Me. Can I draw a line that perfectly fits? You bet you. I remember showing my wife this once, way back in the day. I was drawing lines in the chart, and she's like, but you could draw them anyway. I said, no, no, but there's a science to this. And she said, what's the science? I'm like, science, me, science, it's there. Can't you see it? He couldn't. Neither could I. What are you trying to do when you're putting all these indicators and oscillators? You believe in the theory of complexity. We are hardwired to believe in complexity. We believe that complexity equals success, equals more money, equals all those things that we want. Complexity, we think, rules. And it is simply not true. And in trading, all complexity does is get in the way and give you more spaces for error, more spaces to misinterpret. Simplicity. That's how we make it work. Keeping it simple. Weekly charts are better. They tell you more. The longer your time frame. I love monthly charts, but I'm not that young or that patient. So I do weekly charts. Uh, fundamentals is results. Again, keep it simple. To me, the story is important. I'm going to come back to falling knives. The story is what matters more than anything. So here is an example of complexity. So I just went into Iris Viewpoint, and I picked a couple of random things, and I drew a couple of random lines. And let's be clear, what I got was noise. That's just gibberish. Now, every one of those things, there is somebody out there who will tell you that that is the best thing ever. No, man. That's not true. Best thing ever is a good whiskey. Nice red wine. Those are impressive. That is noise. Fundamentally, just noise. Another part of trading is that you can profit from a falling market. That's quite nice. You can sell what you don't own and you buy it back at a cheaper price. Let's take Sassel. I'm not rubbing it into the Sassel shareholders. 200 bucks. You looked at Sassel and you said this thing's going lower. So what do you do? I borrow some shares from Edition. I sell them into the market at 200 bucks. At 140 Rand, I buy my Sassel shares back. I sold at 200. I bought at 140. So I've reversed the order. I've made 60 bucks. I said to Edition, Thank you, here are your shares. Now, in this case, you don't have to phone addition. This happens automatically in the background if you're trading derivative products. I don't go short. I don't go short because short trading just didn't work for me. The idea of making money in a falling market is beautiful. The idea that everything went down and everyone lost money and I'm the oak who's buying beers tonight because I made the money. Lovely. But it just didn't work for me. You know what happens? I go short, the thing falls. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. 
bounces like crazy. I get stopped out, and then it really falls. So then I'm like, cool. You know what I do? I'll go short in the second drop. Man, the market's for me coming. I don't go short. Shorting has too much volatility. Things fall faster than they rise. My trading methodology is typically trend, definitely lazy. Ergo, I don't go short. Does that hinder my profit? For me personally, no, because I, I did the analysis once and in a 24 month period, my profit from shorting was like negative, like I'd lost money shorting. Might be different for you. You will have to use derivatives for that. So let's look at some strategies and I wanna stress two things here. I'm talking about personal positions. I'm not telling you to go and buy them. My portfolio is public. You can find it at simonbrown.coza. My trade positions are on there as well, but not my derivative positions. I'll touch on that in a second. And what I'm trying to show you is how I do it. What's very important is what I said to you earlier, find what works for you, but you need a foot in the door. Here's your foot. Take this, look at it, turn it upside down, flip it around, use it, don't decide I'm a fool, whatever, work for you. Mr. Price, first thing you do is find the story. Now we're going back, ain't it Mr. Price, uh, it was early this year, it was way back here somewhere in September-ish, where I thought to myself, you know what, there's a story brewing with Mr. Price. In fact, uh, Njibul and Zabandi and I were doing a, a webcast for OST. And the story was quite simple. Back in September last year, we expected to have rate cuts somewhere around the second quarter of this year. Inflation's coming down. Things are looking a little bit better. People's clothing's getting a little bit, you know, tatty because we haven't bought clothes since before the pandemic because it's been a tough four years. And these stocks, Mr. Price, were ridiculously cheap. So there's a good story behind it. That's, and this, you don't have to, you can ignore the story. You can just look at price. For me, when I'm trading shares, I want that story. So then I've got a story and we're sitting here somewhere and I'm like, yeah, okay. So I start drawing some parallel lines and that's the one I like. It comes up there. Now we're looking at about November, it pulls back and now I've got that middle line there. And I'm saying, cool, on a weekly chart, when we get a break of that line, I will buy Mr. Price. No gearing, no CFDs, no futures. I will just soma buy the share. Uh, it late early Jan, it makes that line 168 bucks. I'm in. The first thing you're thinking is, "Yo, dude, you paid 160. You could have paid 130." Yes, but I didn't have certainty there. At 160, my 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 my. Certainty, and that's completely the wrong word. My confidence is markedly higher. At 130, I'm trying to catch 40 now. because I could have made the same compelling story in late 22, and I would have been buying at 190. Nice little base forms, bang, breaks up, giant green candle. I'm in at about 168. Where is my stop loss? At the lower level, a weekly close below that lower resistance line. So in that particular case, I'm in at 168. My stop loss is around 140, call it five. What is that? Doing the math in my head, quickly, it's about 11 or 12%. And Mr. Price trundles along because it turned out we didn't get rate cuts in March. We didn't get rate cuts in June. We might get rate cuts in September. But the point is, the story's still there. Let's roll forward a year again. The consensus is we'll have 1% of rate cuts by ne this time next year. Now look, we've been wrong before, <laughs> let's be clear. Uh, inflation will be back at four and a half, according to the MPC. We've been wrong before. We also got uh, 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 the, the two pot system coming where a lot of people are gonna draw 30,000 Rand. Don't, but a lot will. What are they gonna do with that 30,000 Rand? Spend money. Where are they gonna spend some of that money? Mr. Price. There's a good story there, notwithstanding. And I didn't even have the GNU on my calendar last year. The GNU came along and you can see the GNU. So these charts are from Tuesday. You can see, thank you, GNUs. I also talk around the valuation. So this comes from Coifin. 
I've got a 10 year chart. I've taken the PE, forward PE, the mean is 18.9, the forward is 15 and a half. That's cheap. Price to book, the mean is 6.6, .6 and the history is 3.7. This is a cheap share. Again, the star is from Tuesday. So when I was buying, it was even cheaper when I was buying back in, in, in January. This is a cheap share. And so far, so good. True was, same story. Sorry, Fashini. I get them confused. Fashini Group, same story, but I didn't get in in January because back in January, it was doing all of that and I was waiting for some certainty and I got in on Friday. That was the trade on Friday. I did it. And look, I mean, I did it on that crazy green candle there. And then it went even crazier. On Friday, I got in, and that's the one about 4.30 on Friday afternoon, when I know what my, I'm not know, but I'm fairly certain I'm going to get the candle I want. And that was the trade. When I did it, I suddenly panicked. I'd done the wrong position size. I hadn't, because my brain now knows what my position size is. Same story essentially going through, but it doesn't always work because hello, pick and pay. So let's go back to February. The pick and pay story was quite simple. This business is in deep, deep trouble. It's unlikely to go bankrupt because the debt holders never want to see that happen. And we've got Sean Summers coming back. Is he the right man for the job? Well, certainly the other man wasn't, and the one before wasn't, and the one before wasn't, and the one before that was Sean Summers. So it's the best we got, I guess. And I thought to myself, the stock is cheap. Uh, they might have to do a rights issue, maybe a 2 billion rand rights issue. Everything's cool. What have I got? A nice little break higher. Boom, I enter 20 to 25.50. Literally, like two, three weeks later, it turns out they're doing a 4 billion rand rights issue. It turns out the company is technically insolvent, and they're going to have to sell part of Boxer, which is the only part of the business that does make money. What did the stock do? Collapse in a heap. So what did I do? There's my close below the level, and I take my money and run. Take a loss. I bought it 22.50, sold it 19.90. Take my money and run. And I was saying, well, why haven't I got back in? Because the story has changed. I still think Sean Summers can do it. I still think the stock might go a whole lot higher, but I haven't got the conviction behind the story anymore. That's why. I'm like, thanks, but I will find money elsewhere. I've moved on from pick and pay. It also, I'm going to be totally truthful, hurts a little. Took my money. I don't speak to you no more. How's NVIDIA? Remember I was talking about NVIDIA? So this is post split. So it runs up like crazy in early 23 and it gets to what was then $400, but it's now 40. And everyone says it's crazy expensive. But is there a story behind NVIDIA? Yes, one, AI. Is AI the future? Yeah, who matters? Right now, people can't buy enough chips. NVIDIA's got a backlist that runs in two months, and they can't make them fast enough. Meta and Facebook and everybody else's R&D money, or CapEx money, rather, is basically being spent at NVIDIA. They are probably two to three years ahead of the competing uh, chip manufacturers. And Moore's Law says you double every 18 months, these guys' chips are going about seven or eight times every 18 months better, which means when you're two or three years behind, you are like using, who here remembers Pentiums, computers. Yeah. The youngins are like, hmm? ask an old person. And there was your break. And if you missed the first break, there was your second break. And this is, again, an old chart. It's now $140 because this chart's from Tuesday, and NVIDIA don't go to sleep. I hold everything I have shown you there except pick and pay. Fool me once. So that's my one strategy for equity. No gearing, nothing fancy. Buy the share. Sassel. Don't, 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 don't catch falling knives. Don't buy stories where there isn't a story. Now, if you're looking at fundamentals, the story for Sassel is slightly improving. Chemical prices are picking up. That's a good story for Sassel. They have kitchen sink the results and written everything off. That's a good story for Sassel. Transnet owes them 6 billion rand. Good luck with that. Transnet doesn't have 6 billion rand. 
there certainly was there back in May of 23, a bit of an argument to be buying it. I remember when I was on holiday over December, people were making an argument, wait for there to be a good story and price action to follow it. That's my strategy. You might look at that chart and say, yeah, no, dude, I can see buy signals like no tomorrow. Fine. But have a system, have a process. Index trading, these are trade ungeared. This is a simple seven EMA versus 21 EMA. EMA is exponential moving average. Any charting package will have it. This comes from Iris Viewpoint. You'll find it on WebTrader. When the, when the seven EMA goes up through the 21 EMA, I buy it. I hold it until the price goes below the 21 EMA. So this is the S&P updated for this afternoon. I think, no, not updated for Tuesday. I got in at about 4,400. I'm still sitting there. I'm up 23%. I'm also long NASDAQ. I'm long all over the place. Again, not good. You could buy the ETF. I use VOO, which is the S&P 500 ETF in the US. NASDAQ, I use QQQM. The M is slightly cheaper in terms of TUR. All of them available on the Standard Bank platforms. Rocket science required? Zero. Time required? Yeah, minutes and a half every week. Lazy trading. And then we come to my favorite thing in the world to trade, because this is good old school gritty trading, Aussie futures. So here you're trading an index, not a price. So you're trading points. So if you look at the screen here, let me go to the next screen because I blow it up. So the index is 73,020. You buy it at 73,020. That's not how much you pay. You pay margin, which is either almost 100K or 10K, depending whether it's Aussie or Omi. And it goes up and you make 300 points, and each point has a value. On the Aussie, it's 10 rand a point. On the Omi, it is one rand a point. Goes up 300 points, you've made 3,000 rand on, on, on 300 points is 3,000 rand on Aussie and 300 rand on Omi. This is a brilliant place. If you want to trade proper good old fashioned, just charts, technical analysis, index, this is the place to start. You can trade Omi with a 20,000 rand account and you can do proper 2% risk management. Real McCoy. And then in time, you can upgrade and you can trade Aussie. I'm trading this early morning. I enter my trades at, uh, uh, there it is there, uh, 9.38. I enter my trade either long or short. It takes me. I log in at about 8.35. I watch it for three minutes. I enter the position. I put in my target. I put in my stop loss. I leave it. If it goes right, I make 300 points. If it goes wrong, I, make, I lose 200 at max. My win ratio is about 51%, which is not bad, but my winners pay me 300 and my losers at worst pay me two, take me 200. I make money from it. And it's about three minutes in the morning. The challenge is I forget. Too often I'm on the balcony having a cigarette and a coffee. This is the best thing to trade. Or me. You will get proper experience. You will become a proper hardened trader. And every point is only one rand. So it's not going to bankrupt you. And this is just, this is Iris Viewpoint. There is nothing special. Your transaction costs are 12 and 50. I am buying a contract which is worth 730,000 ZAR. And Standard Bank says, yeah, it's going to cost you 12 and 50 to transact. I'm like, do you want a tip? Because <laughs> no one's making money here. But it's a great place to learn because it teaches you those skills. It teaches that emotion. The problem with my Mr. Price trade is I've been long since January and you've learned nothing since January. This thing, you can do 10 trades before tea time and you can get your head freaked out 10 times before tea time. You can have the highs of making money and the lows of losing money and kicked in the head and beaten around dozens of times in one day. You accelerate the learning. Maybe you don't want to, but love me some Aussie. I said already, find what works for you. And that's hard. I'm saying to you, this is a universe where you can do anything you want. Now find your own way. And you're like, yo, but where do I even start? Well, take what I've shown you this evening, pull it apart, put it back together, turn it on its head, show it to some friends, decide it's good, bad, or ugly, adapt it, keep it the same, as a foot in the door. And ultimately, the market must work for you, not you for the market. 
that is so incredibly important. I used to do it the other way around, where I was the slave to the market. I don't want to be a slave to no market. The market must pay me money. There are some books, anything by Mark Douglas will help you with the mental attitude. Uh, Edward uh, Lefebvre's Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. Uh, Jack Schrager, he's got dozens of books, anything by him. And then The Complete Turtle Trader by Michael Koval. Careful, he will try and sell you things. Do not buy the things. They're just black boxes. Anyone who says to you, I've got a trading system, pay me some money. Uh, hang on. If the trading system's working, why do you need money? You're selling it because it doesn't make money. Because if it makes money, you're keeping it very secret in the corner. Okay, quick tax. Because I've run my time and tax is simple. Get professional advice. Short answer, if you are trading, sales will say, thank you, income, add it to your tax, tax at your marginal rate. However, what is your income? Your income is all your profitable trades minus brokerage, data costs, losing trades, books, subscriptions to financial mail, any costs associated. This is a business. The revenue is winners and everything else is cost. If you have a net loss for the year, you cannot offset it against other income. It's ring fenced. It will come back to you in later years when you make a profit. Speak to an accountant. You can trade in your tax-free account, tax-free, but don't start there because you don't want to lose that money. And then suddenly my doofus said, let's not work anymore. <sighs> Keep it simple. Start where it's easiest. Your first swimming lesson did not take mean you jumped off the pier at Durban in 12-foot waves. Your first swimming lesson was in a kiddie's pool with armbands and a lifeguard, and you were an adult, and they only came up to your ankles. Same with trading. And that's starting safe with shares and indices. Practice. Stop losses are hard. So get yourself an IRIS account. Find the 40 shares in the top 40. And draw a stop loss for every single share where you think it should be. Come back in a week and see what happened and update it. Do that every week for the next year. You've now done 50 times 40. You've done 2,000 stop losses in a year. You'll slowly start to see what I mean by hide it. You'll slowly start to see the market action. This is a skill we learn. And this is exactly how we learn it. Avoid gearing until profitable. Be patient. Have a plan. Stick to the plan. Most important, I say it again, find what works for you. And that will be different for everyone in this room. But the important point, every single one of us in this room has the capacity, the ability to be a profitable trader. Because there is no rocket science here. None whatsoever. We all have it within ourselves. We've just got to have the determination and the discipline. Next event, 18 July, is up defensive income. Ladies and gents, I'm going to leave it there. I've run my time. I apologize for that. I hate running my time. I appreciate your time is important. I just want to, a huge thank you to everyone on the webcast. A bigger thank you to everyone who came in. You all had many options of what you could do on your chilly Thursday evening here. Uh, you chose to spend it with us. For that, we are honored, and thank you very, very much. A huge thank you to Standard Bank for the venue, the snacks, the coffee, the opportunity, uh, and everything else. Uh, as I always say, look after yourself, and if you can, look after somebody else as well. Thank you very, very much for your time this evening.